ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's my pleasure to invite you to participate this evening in a discussion, a conversation on art and finance. And we're going to talk for about 35 to 40 minutes and then open it up to you to comment or ask your questions. And there'll be roving microphones, so please wait for them before you launch into your contribution. Uh, it's my great privilege to share this conversation with Gabriele Finaldi, who in the space of only 18 months has made already a remarkable contribution, not just to the National Gallery, but to the art scene in this country. Now, as I said, we're going to talk about the interaction between art and finance, how finance and money and banking have contributed to the commissioning of works of art and the collecting of great works of art. But also, we're going to talk about how artists have portrayed the world of money and banking, which has supported them. Now, it, one of Gabriele's predecessors, uh, Kenneth Clark, wrote, and I quote, some of the most valuable things in civilization are made possible only by fluid capital. I take it fluid capital is museum director's jargon for what the rest of us might call money. <laughs> uh, and clearly, it is necessary to support these extraordinary works of art, which, in my experience, what makes them special is their immediate appeal to anybody who can walk in off the street. You don't need a PhD or a certain degree of training to be moved by a great painting. But I want to ask Gabrielli first why it was that uh, you know, the wealthy of previous, not just generations, but centuries, people like the Medicis and others, decided to use their wealth to sponsor or commission works of art. Was it a religious motive? Was it um, you know, personal prestige or a sense of responsibility? Why did they do it? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here this evening. I could also say just two words of uh, introduction before we get in deep into the discussion. Um, I first met um, Mervyn King um, in Madrid when I was working there um, at the Prado. He was uh, visiting the Prado together with the, um, the Director General of the, um, of the Bank of Spain. Um, the Bank of Spain, of course, is a very interesting uh, uh, place that houses uh, a wonderful collection. We might have a quick word about that um, afterwards. Um, and, of course, I was delighted to find him uh, as a trustee of the National Gallery when I returned. Um, it's always, I'm always slightly in awe of Mervyn because every day I walk through the corridor of the uh, National Gallery to my office and there are the lists of uh, all the trustees from the beginning of the history of the gallery in the 1820s right through to today. And he appears as the Lord King. You don't get much more impressive than that, uh, I'm afraid. Um, so he, of course, is a, is, is a, a great expert on uh, world finance. Um, and he's also very, very highly specialized in, uh, in, in paintings. Uh, I know a little bit about paintings. So let's see how the discussion goes. Um, so the Medici. Um, I suppose traditionally, um, wealthy people um, commission works of art, traditionally, in Europe anyway, uh, essentially to uh, demonstrate their piety, on the one hand, and uh, secondly, I think, also to uh, demonstrate their magnificenza. This is a word that's often used, particularly in the Italian Renaissance context, because if you were wealthy in the Renaissance, um, it was completely appropriate that you showed uh, how wealthy you were by commissioning works of art which in some way benefited uh, the public. So it was considered a civic virtue to display magnificenza, to display that your money was being put to good use. In fact, it was more admirable and more virtuous to uh, be shown to be spending your money rather than to be making money. Um, so the Medici, I think, uh, are, to, to, to use perhaps the most um, prominent example, um, were, were certainly wanting to uh, commission uh, public works for, uh, uh, to, to demonstrate their uh, their contribution to society and also to magnify uh, themselves. And that's a very, very important element of why art is commissioned, I think, uh, particularly in that period. So it, was, it's, it wasn't conspicuous consumption in the sense of throwing wild parties. It was actually doing something both in architecture and painting. Yes, indeed. But of course, the, the Medici did throw wild parties the whole time, particularly uh, Lorenzo de' Medici was particularly famous for the, the parties and the, and the fireworks and, uh, and the dances um, uh, and so on. The other thing that I, I think is important to um, remember is that um, 
Of course, the wealth often lay with merchants and bankers. Um, and bankers, of course, made their money essentially through usury. Um, this was a problematic issue uh, in medieval times and in the Renaissance because usury was considered a very serious sin. And if you look at um, Dante's Inferno, uh, the usurers appear very deep down in hell, actually. They, they appear in the seventh, deep down in the seventh circle of hell, which is um, even worse than violent murderers or suicides. So that's where usurers were. So how do you get around that problem? Well, one of the ways in which you get around it is, is manufacturing, so spending your money, putting it to good uh, use. Uh, the other thing is, is, this is very important in relation to the Medici, and that is that um, some of the most famous pictures that they commissioned actually show a particular subject, which is the adoration of the kings. Well, the adoration of the kings, what are they doing? They're bringing their gifts to the Christ child. So they're, they're giving their money away. Uh, they're giving their money away to set up hospitals, to set up uh, homes for um, those who are uh, in need and so on. So in a sense, um, doing good works with their money uh, and showing that in the works of art or the buildings that they commission uh, becomes a, um, a moral justification. Usury isn't really a big issue when interest rates are at zero. That's obviously <laughs> why, why we cut rates to zero, to avoid going into the seventh depth of hell. Um, <laughs> But th this was commissioning new paintings, new works of art. When, when, did, That's right. when did the issue of you know, wealth turn into collecting paintings as opposed to commissioning new ones? Well, I suppose collecting is, um, is connected with, um, with uh, prestige and also with, uh, with, um, with education. So you'll find that, for example, the, the Milordis who travel to the, the, com the continent are acquiring uh, great works of art, um, sculptures, um, they're acquiring drawings, they're acquiring paintings, and so on, and bringing those back. And uh, they form a sort of cultural context in which they, um, in which they function in their, various, um, in their various activities. The really interesting thing from our point of view, and you as, as a trustee of the gallery, of course, uh, is that these works which are acquired uh, by private citizens, uh, wealthy private citizens, somehow find their way into public collections. So uh, they end up um, being for the benefit of the public. That's not necessarily what they were originally uh, bought for, what those collections were originally, originally made for. But they do um, eventually um, you know, benefit uh, the public. And the National Gallery is, is a very good um, example of that, as are other public collections. If, if you <clears throat> move on, uh, in the 19th century, the expression in the second half of the 19th century was very much you know, the art is in Europe and the money is in America. And no one did more to exploit that than the famous Lord Duveen, who also was a trustee for a period of the National Gallery, controversially. Uh, but what's interesting there was that initially he persuaded business magnates from industry uh, to acquire paintings. He persuaded them that to demonstrate their success in life, they should build an art collection. And then the real achievement was later on to persuade them that when they died, they should leave that collection to the nation or in the form of a museum open to the public. And that was a very, uh, that's very much the American tr tradition of how their paintings and museums were, were created. Yeah, I, I, going back to um, the origins of the National Gallery Collection, this is the institution which we're, the two of us are so bound up with. Um, there's a banker at the beginning of that as well. Um, there's a, a, a banker called Angustine of Russian origin who um, becomes the founder of Modern Lloyds, uh, who makes a huge amount of money um, through um, the, the shipping business, but also through uh, banking. And he forms a collection. He's forming a collection just at the time uh, when you really can form a spectacular collection, which is after a revolution. That's, that's clearly the best moment to try and form a, a collection. So all this um, work sort of floats onto the market, um, and uh, you can acquire some very spectacular things. When he uh, dies in 1823, um, the UK Parliament uh, decides that this is the moment, various opportunities have been missed before, this is the moment where we can uh, found a, a national collection. This is the moment where we can buy these pictures and establish a, 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 a gallery for the public. So this idea of you know, private wealth 
creating collections which eventually benefit the public is wonderfully um, demonstrated uh, there. I'm not sure that um, Angus Dean necessarily had that in mind when he was forming his collection. In fact, he instructed his, uh, his uh, executors to, to sell the collection, and he imagined it, I suppose, going onto the market and being uh, distributed amongst, uh, amongst the London collectors and so on. But in fact, it was bought as a, as a group, as a lot, uh, and became the basis of our, of our national collection. But it is that very attractive thing that eventually um, the efforts of private collectors, in many cases, and this is the case also with, with the Americans that you've cited, um, end up benefiting the public in, in public institutions. There's interesting migration of works you know, from churches, from private palaces, eventually entering uh, uh, private collections of wealthy collectors, and then eventually finding their way into public um, institutions. How far do these <coughs> private collections lend themselves easily to absorption in a great public museum? Uh, I mean, the, sometimes you get great collections which form a, a theme, they have a unity about them, which means they can stand alone, either in a separate museum or in a separate wing or room. Other times they're rather eclectic, and they, to be seen at their best, need to be uh, moved into partnership paintings from a similar period and style. How, how many private collections really did stand the test of time in being standalone collections? Oh, there are, there are collections of that um, sort of quality. As a general rule, though, I think that collectors have tended to specialise in particular areas where they found themselves um, at ease, comfortable, what they really, uh, what they really liked. Um, I suppose for museums, it's slightly complicated at times when, um, when a, a collector donates the collection uh, and wants it preserved as a separate entity. Um, it's partly to do with that concept of manufacenza. You know, I want to be recognised for the collection that I formed uh, and have placed so much um, of myself in. Um, but I think it's, you know, the, these are gifts which are tremendously um, important to, um, to, to, to public collections. And if you look at the, the, the National Gallery, for example, or you look at other institutions, you know, gift giving um, is extremely important. And you've spent much more time in America than I have. You actually um, teach um, in, in America. What's your impression of how that gift giving to, uh, to museums has um, created those collections and created the, the rapport between the collections or the institutions and the public? Well, I think one of the extraordinary things about, uh, say, the Met in New York is that you can go to certain individuals' drawing rooms and then 20 years later you see the drawing room recreated inside the Met, uh, literally, uh, furnishings, paintings, everything. So there is very much a sense in which uh, a <coughs> relatively small number of individuals have built up staggering collections and then they have been donated. The, the interesting thing about the States, I think, is that most of the people who, led, who contributed to, say, the National Gallery of Art or the Met or the Frick um, were largely business magnates, not financiers or bankers as such. But if you look at today's business magnates, people like Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, actually they have decided not to focus their efforts on art, either by collecting art or by commissioning it, but to support medical charities, solving the problems of the world. And it seems to me that the people who are genuinely contribu contributing to the world of art are actually now bankers and financiers, either individually or often as institutions. I mean, some of the large financial institutions around the world, public or private, uh, have built quite remarkable collections, which they, they may not particularly want to boast about now, given the climate for banking. And so I can think of one very large American bank that acquired a remarkable collection of art through a takeover, and the condition of the takeover was that they not dispose of that art collection. And that's been a, that was a regulatory uh, intervention, and it was a very sensible thing to do, which the bank itself now recognises as being a valuable restriction on what it wanted to do. If you look at the public sector, um, the Deutsche Bundesbank, central bank in Germany, started in a fairly small way when it was created in the mid-1950s, just spending a certain amount of money each year buying contemporary German art. But they chose very well. They had good advisors. And now, you know, 60 years later, they have an extraordinarily valuable collection of modern German art. Now, 
Most central banks don't do that. You uh, mentioned the, the Bank of Spain has a remarkable collection of Goyas, mm. but that's because Goya actually worked for the Bank of Spain. He was an employee. Um, I can't remember many painters of that quality who work for the Bank of England. But, uh, <laughs> I may have missed them. I may have not appreciated their, their contribution. Um, but do you think that there is a, a return, if you like, to the interest of people in the financial sector as opposed to the industrial sector? Yeah, I, th I think it's always been there in some way. Perhaps there's been um, slight variations over, over time, but certainly um, I think you, you'll find, and, and you as a, as a man who spends quite a bit of time in New York will know that sort of finances are investing very seriously in mostly in contemporary art, mm. not so much in, yeah. uh, in, in older art. Um, so that's, a, that's a, uh, an interesting phenomenon in itself. But I think if you look historically, in a sense, art has always gone where, where the money is. I mean, you look back at ancient Rome, and uh, you know, the great works of art from Greece were being imported into uh, Rome. So the art, as it were, follows the money. It's just a fact of life. The artists go where the commissions are uh, to be had. Um, you know, the great um, collections formed in the 17th century. I mean, the, the sort of exodus of works from uh, Italy to Britain when Charles I was collecting, was prepared to spend large amounts of money to acquire works from the Gonzagas or, you know, all that fantastic um, movement of works of art from Flanders and from uh, Italy uh, travelling towards Spain when Spain was the, the, the greatest um, power on earth. And, of course, we've seen that in the, in the uh, late 19th and 20th century where, once again, those collections moving to, to the Americas. Um, that's also happening, I suppose, in our own time, but in a, in, a different, uh, in a different direction. So it is interesting how, if you were to look at the amount of money spent on art, say in New York, uh, how many people with the money have decided that it is easier to go to a contemporary art gallery and get advice and find someone who will tell them what they should buy. Um, and... and quite why this is, you know, it's led to an explosion of prices in contemporary painting. And I'm surprised by how many people seem to prefer pictures of soup, soup tins or soup cans rather than one of the wonderful still lifes that we have in the National Gallery. Yeah, especially because they're much cheaper, actually. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> they can be had for much less, uh, much less money. Absolutely. So there is this extraordinary phenomenon in which it would be possible for people with that amount of money to save it on buying some of the most extraordinary and rather odd aspects of contemporary art and acquire a very, very attractive collection of old master paintings, but there doesn't seem to be the interest in that. And is that because of I mean, cultural moray? People are not trained in the history of art, or why is I that? I think there are various reasons. I think a very significant uh, motivation for, uh, for people buying works of art is um, is the, the prestige of a trophy acquisition. Uh, if you buy a, a, you know, a, a major important work by Andy Warhol, that's significant. Everyone will recognize it, and that grants you a sort of instant, uh, instant prestige. Um, there's also the investment element, and I imagine yeah. you, you deal um, uh, with a lot of uh, investors, you know, to invest in works of art because you know that um, further down the line you can sell them again and you can, you can make a profit. So the trophy acquisition, the um, investment aspect of it, but also I think, you know, in a sense, old paintings or old works of art they're they're more complicated, they're more difficult, there are attributional issues. You know, is this actually by Giovanni Bellini or is it by a member of his studio? All, all those categories you read in the uh, in the Christie's and uh, Sotheby's auction catalogues. You know, follower of, uh, uh, you know, exactly where does this work fit in? Well, that's not such an issue. Uh, with with uh, contemporary art, so there's much greater certainty involved. Although there are clamorous cases also of of, of fakes, of course, being uh, mm -hmm. being made in in, uh, in in contemporary production, as well. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, I think it's 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 more difficult. You need a very very kind of personal commitment, I think, to to acquire older art, whether that's ancient sculpture um, or, or um, you know old master paintings. So if um, if art follows the money. And if we look now where the money is, it's hard not to look at Asia, the, the renaissance of Asia. Um, what do you think this is going to tell us about the way in which art collecting and buying will develop over the rest of this century? Is, is the rise of Asia really going to make a big difference? 
I, it, for me, it's very difficult to tell. I, 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 uh, <coughs> I was listening to Philippe de Montebello, who many of you will, will, will know, um, former director of the Met. He was for 31 years director of the Met. And he was saying, you know, the, the, the shift in works of art, you know, from south to north, and then from north to west, and now this um, move of works of art from west to the east. And he sort of said, well, it's their turn. You know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 these movements have happened over time, and now it's, in a sense, it's, it's, it's their turn, and that's what we have to kind of recognize and uh, accept. I mean, one of the statistics that I think is incredibly telling is that in China, there are a thousand museums being built uh, as we speak. A thousand museums being built as we speak. Um, the, 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 I mean, it's interesting to see what kind of works are uh, are, are also being uh, acquired in in the Far East. The phenomenon, of course, of the of the the, the Gulf states and the uh, huge investment in the, 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 the museum <coughs> infrastructure that's going on there is an absolutely uh, fascinating uh, uh, phenomenon. Um, the kinds of works that also are being acquired for for those museums. What is it exactly that is happening there? To what end? How long will it last? And these are questions which I think are not easy to, to find definitive answers for right now. Do you imagine, a, uh, I mean, many, many public galleries in the West have far more paintings than they can display. And there are very good reasons for being concerned about the idea of just selling them. It might well have an enormous disincentive effect on future donations. But obviously loans are a possibility. Do you see, is there, is there, are there signs of a demand in, amongst these museums in Middle East or the Far East for wanting to display Western old masters? Or are they in fact concerned about going back and discovering the treasures of art in their own past? Well, I think the, the, what happened in Japan was very interesting. There was a lot of collecting um, uh, in, the, in the 1980s and, and, mm. and 90s of, um, of Western European art, particularly uh, French Impressionism in, in, in particular, uh, early 20th century painting too. Uh, that came to a rather sudden um, end with the financial crisis that they uh, suffered. Um, what's happened in, uh, in the Gulf is, of course, you've had a lot of collecting of um, Islamic art of the very highest uh, quality. And um, for those of you who haven't uh, visited, you know, the, the, to go to Doha and see the, Isla the, uh, uh, the Islamic Art Museum there is a very, very spectacular um, experience. And, and it's certainly, um, it's certainly a, a museum which seeks to uh, bring together the extraordinary wealth of art produced in the, uh, in the Islamic world. The, the other thing that's happened, of course, is that the uh, in the uh, Gulf states, they teamed up with uh, Western institutions, the Louvre on the one hand and the Guggenheim uh, on, on the other. Very, very interesting uh, phenomenon in its, in, in, in its own right. And the Louvre, for example, has uh, spearheaded this, um, this great uh, plan to create a museum of essentially Western art um, in uh, Abu Dhabi, um, advising on acquisitions, but also committing to lend uh, works of art from their own collections, and also to offer uh, technical uh, assistance. I think the French have viewed that very much part of their, uh, of their um, uh, diplomatic uh, po policy, um, you know, soft uh, diplomacy, which the, the, the French, I think, understand uh, quite a lot uh, about. I remember um, I went over with the director of the Prado, and uh, we found that, as usual, the Spaniards had arrived rather late because the, uh, the, the French had already been there, the Germans were advising several museums, and the British Museum was also present, so there was really nothing left for, for the Spaniards to, 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 to do there. We also felt that as a museum which was primarily of um, Christian religious art and naked ladies lying on beds, um, there probably wasn't a huge amount that, uh, that would be of, uh, of, uh, of uh, necessary uh, or would be hugely required uh, in in, uh, in in Qatar or Abu Dhabi. I say that a little bit as a joke, but um, I, I should think the demand to see pictures of naked ladies lying on beds will be <laughs> just as strong there as here. <laughs> With maybe not quite so much focusing on the Christian yeah. dimension of it. Yeah. Um, no, it was interesting yeah. because the the um, when we asked the Louvre, you know, how did they? Um, approach the acquisitions for, um, for the Louvre um, Abu Dhabi. And they said, as freely as we approach 
um, acquisitions for the Louvre itself. Um, so I said, well, you know, would you acquire a frag on our lady on a sofa? And they said, yes, we'd have absolutely no problem in, in, in acquiring that. I suspect very few of those sorts of works have been uh, acquired, but certainly the, 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 the French felt it was very, very important that they should have a completely free hand in acquiring and advising on acquisitions for, uh, for the Louvre Abu Dhabi. I mean, it's quite interesting to contrast the motives of the museum directors or people responsible for museums on the one hand with your story of the Japanese collectors buying as individuals who in that period clearly were buying them with speculative investments. Um, and you've seen an element of that in the art market clearly, um, much more with contemporary art. But it seems somehow that the paintings that go for the highest price um, are always paintings that were produced roughly 100 years before today. And what those paintings are obviously moves on with time. But why is there this sort of peak pricing issue when people pay more for that? Now moving clearly, uh, you know, it, it, it's gone through Impressionism. It's moving almost beyond that now. Yeah, it's a, Impressionism, a classic modern, as it's sometimes called, works of art from the, the early 20th century. But of course, you know, what, what's been really surprising is how um, contemporary art has um, grown spectacularly to the point where you know it's it's you know as uh, expensive to buy um, you know a work by Francis Bacon recently uh, deceased uh, as it is to buy you know a, a painting by um, Velasquez uh, or, or one of the great uh, Renaissance uh, masters. So that is a that is an extraordinary uh, phenomenon. I think that is it is one of recent uh, times, and perhaps it has to do with this you know spectacular growth in. Uh, in uh, individuals and their, um, their their capital, mostly from from uh, from uh, uh, the sort of high level business speculation. So there's a parallel in a way with with literature in which we spend so much of our time focusing on the candidates for the Booker Prize, the Man Booker Prize, when it is almost certainly the case that most of us have not read some of the greatest novels that were produced in the previous hundred years. Yeah. And we're sort of immensely focused on what's just being produced. And that may be an aspect of contemporary culture, or it may always have been, been the case that people had this, this view. Let me ask you about the role of governments in all this. We talked about you know, individuals, but the, I mean, you, the origin of the National Gallery was Parliament deciding to set up a National Gallery for and choosing a location for it that was quite deliberately chosen not to be a sort of upper middle class sanctuary in Kensington, but right in the heart of central London. Somehow it seems a very atypical way for our parliament to behave. <laughs> Have you been inundated with MPs concerned about the role of art in the modern world? We, we do. We do have a, a constant stream of uh, MPs and lords coming to, uh, coming to visit us, which is, um, which is heartening because I think it's important that um, the, 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 the sort of political representatives and the powers that be are aware of what's, uh, what's going on in the public institutions. And in addition to uh, funding them, are also aware of you know, the kinds of people who are visiting, what it is that we're doing at, a, uh, at the level of um, you know, talking to the public, of, of um, you know, having our uh, uh, education programs and our touring uh, exhibitions and so on. So we have the all-party um, arts and heritage group come to every single exhibition we do, which is um, a great pleasure uh, for us. I'm very pleased that that does um, actually happen. Um, in, in Europe, of course, the tradition has been that museums are state museums. So the state has always taken a very, very great interest in uh, its institutions. It's created the institutions and it's sustained the institution. That model has um, uh, worked very effectively until now. Um, the state, I think, still feels tremendously responsible for our uh, cultural institutions. Um, although I think in recent times we've seen um, the state slightly stepping back uh, simply because of the cost of maintaining uh, some of these large institutions. I mean, as, as an example, um, when I was in Spain, I arrived in Spain in 2003, well, the, the, the Prado was supported uh, sort of almost three quarters uh, in terms of its uh, operating budget by the state. Um, by the time I left... Uh, 13 years later, in 2015, that had gone down to about a quarter 
of its operating budget. That was very, very dramatic um, falling off. Um, in Britain, uh, the national institutions certainly are uh, still well supported, although it's, it is, you know, if you look at it long term, it's a diminishing uh, amount. But the sense that you know, these national institutions are the responsibility of uh, government, uh, of the state, uh, is tremendously important, tremendously uh, embedded, because these are considered institutions which, are, um, which have an educational function, which have a, a prestige function, um, which are, um, particularly today, Im terribly important for uh, tourism and for the, uh, for the economy. So the support of the, the, support of the state is absolutely uh, fundamental. When we look at uh, America, we have a quite different situation. You might like to say a word or two about how you found uh, the way the American institutions work compared to the European institutions. Well, it's certainly true that I would never be a trustee, could not be a trustee uh, of an American gallery because my net worth is nowhere near high enough to <laughs> qualify for the sort of minimal level that you're expected to contribute towards. And I think that does have a, an impact on the, on the culture and the, the, the way the museums go about things. They, they are very much agglomerations of separate collections. They don't, don't always fit terribly well together. Um, and there is some... I mean, one of the remarkable qualities of the National Gallery is that although it is one of the smallest major art galleries in the world in terms of the <laughs> sheer number of paintings, it actually has more visitors than almost anywhere except the Louvre. So it has more visitors than the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. That's quite astonishing. Uh, and I think that, that reveals this um, ability of art to transcend all other differences. You stand in front of a great painting, your background your ethnicity, your gender, your academic training, your education, your nationality, count for naught. You are a human being in front of these great paintings and you are moved by what you see. And I think that's one of the most remarkable things about it. So, you know, more people in this country go to museums and galleries than attend Premier League football matches, which is not what you might think from the coverage in the press or on television, but it's true. And, and there is that remarkable quality that when people want that something important happens in their lives, they sometimes just quietly find their way into the National Gallery and you see them there in front of a, of a painting. That is the enormous importance you know, of, of the galleries. And the, there is, a, in, obviously, in, the, in America, this real sense of responsibility and commitment that if you have been successful in life, you must give something back. And... There is no one area in which that dominates. Some people will give money, probably too many, in terms of medical research and hospitals. They're overflowing with cash in many ways. But an awful lot to do with museums and art galleries as well. And that gives, you know, that, that is the basis by, of which the American museum profession operates. I think you put that very uh, beautifully, the, the experience of standing in front of a great work of art, something you can't actually put a price on. We're talking about art and finance. Um, I did just want to say a word about um, the comparison uh, between European and uh, American institutions. I remember years ago we also, all, all used to be hugely in admiration of um, the American institutions, and we particularly uh, were envious of these huge endowments on which they sit and said, you know, wouldn't that be great if we could have endowments of that kind which guarantee that we could do all our programs, that we could buy uh, great works of art for the collection, that we could do everything that we wanted to, to do. Um, whereas, you know, we have to make do with, um, you know, the annual uh, grant in aid, whatever country you're in, it's, uh, France, uh, Spain, uh, Italy or, or, or Britain. Um, and, you know, it, it's not a huge amount and uh, we can just about sort of struggle on. And then, of course, the great financial crisis came and we saw uh, all those endowments lose huge uh, percentage of their value. And we suddenly thought, isn't it great to be European? And isn't it great to have um, the kind of um, state support that is constant? Um, it may not be huge, but it's pretty constant um, and guarantees um, our survival, guarantees our, um, our uh, ongoing uh, existence. So, um, you know, the, the, while there are some things that we hugely admire, um, there are other things that we're tremendously um, uh, proud of, and uh, it's, it's based on the, the, the tradition that's been established of you know, state support for, uh, for, the, uh, for the institutions. 
The other thing, of course, about the, the American institutions, we think of them very often as um, private institutions. You know, they're, these are, they're non-profit organizations, mostly. Uh, there are few, very few states, in the sense of, the, as we understand them here in, in Europe, you know, if you think of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, that is truly a federal institution completely supported by um, federal funds and so on, and uh, free for uh, everyone and so on. But that's absolutely a, a rarity. Most American uh, museum institutions are actually, um, are actually non-profit organizations which are largely supported by um, private support. But not, uh, certainly not, um, there's a very significant element of, uh, of, uh, of state support, maybe the, lo the state or the city, um, in terms of the way taxation happens in, uh, in this, this very great tradition there is of philanthropy, which is um, highly recognized and tremendously well supported by the tax code. That is potentially under threat now because Mr. Trump has said he wants to cut tax rates and his advisors have said they're going to do it by cutting out a lot of exemptions. Charitable deductions are one exemption they may look at, but we will see. Now, you mentioned art following the money. That means the artist must have a sort of love-hate relationship with the people providing the money, which leads us naturally, and I think, to the question of how artists and art have portrayed the world of money and banking in the past. You know, sometimes you can find paintings of, which are obviously of a banker dealing with a client, and then you'll see a little vignette in the background of someone weighing coins to remind you <laughs> that the gold coins may not be quite what they're worth. Uh, that the banker is claiming. But can you say something about how artists have chosen to portray this world from which they have drawn so much support? Yeah. Well, uh, the, uh, bankers are often, of course, or, or wealthy collectors appear, of course, in, in, in portraits. Um, and then it's not so often you get a banking scene represented in, uh, in a painting un unless it's um, a, a saint associated with, uh, with, with banking. Um, but... Very recently, for example, the Met uh, acquired a very interesting painting, which is a portrait of uh, the great German banker, uh, Jabash. Now, Jabash was a 17th century Cologne-born uh, banker who became banker to Cardinal Mazarin and consequently um, uh, uh, was, was uh, banker to the French crown. Um, he has himself represented with his family on the one side, so as it were, the domestic um, uh, jabash on the one on the one hand. On the other hand, you have on the other side of the picture, you have uh, the painter himself represented in a in a mirror. So you see the painter as he's at work representing uh, the great banker with his family. But then you also have him surrounded by uh, books in uh, representation of uh, learning and intellectual uh, aspirations. Uh, you have the the figure of uh, the bust of Minerva representing the, the, the goddess of, uh, of wisdom. So uh, somebody like Shabash, who has also created a huge collection uh, of his own, most of which, or a very, very significant part of which, will go towards um, the creation of the royal collection in Paris and subsequently the Louvre. So, for example, um, you know, the, the, the cabinet of drawings in the Louvre is essentially uh, founded on the drawings collection of uh, Shabash, which was sold to to Louis XIV. So they certainly want to uh, have themselves represented as um, people of uh, culture and uh, learning. So wealth is tremendously important, but wealth is associated also with, uh, with culture, uh, with uh, learning, um, and sometimes in earlier periods, I guess, uh, with, with devotion too. Mm. Well, this, this gives me a chance to talk about the, the great paintings in the Bank of England. Very and good. the Bank of England's contribution to the world of great painting. Now, I mentioned earlier the Bundesbank's collection of modern art and the Bank of Spain's collection of Goya's. We have nothing remotely like that. But we do have the very good contemporary painting of life, the, the uh, London um, International Financial Futures Exchange in the, the old Royal Exchange building. Uh, there is the famous painting by George Hicks, Dividend Day, 1859, which shows people crowding into the bank of ho banking halls to receive their coupon payments uh, on government stock. Um, but in a sense, more interesting is the, the, more, the more recent uh, development where when uh, Montague Norman knocked down the, the great old Bank of England, which John Soane had designed and built, probably the greatest architectural damage done to London in the whole of the 
the 30s and 40s together and built the new bank, he actually commissioned Thomas Monnington, uh, an English painter who later became president of the Royal Academy, to come and paint murals inside the Bank of England depicting scenes from the everyday life of the Bank of England. And they are there to this day, and you can see them if you can find a way of getting in. They're on the corridor where the Monetary Policy Committee sits. And interestingly, it, they all came out of a group of painters who went to the British School of Rome uh, at the end of the First World War and came back determined that collectively they would paint murals in great civic buildings in this country. Mornington did one in the Bristol uh, Council Chamber, but many of the others painted murals in, very other, in, in lots of other parts of the, the civic architecture of this country. And that was a way in which they wanted to contribute. Now, the sad thing about murals is that when our uh, councils decide to knock buildings down, the murals tend to go with them. So many of these have not survived. But the Mornington murals really have, and they are a very interesting example of how you know, the Bank of England was actually supporting art in that particular way. And I'd like to think that institutions will feel some responsibility to do that as they, as they go along. Can I ask you, Mervyn, um, I think we're drawing the, the discussion we to a, a close, but um, did, you, did the bank have to commission a portrait of you, um, so having the, been the, the, the Bank, bank the, of England? So the Bank of England's jewel in the crown, of course, is that it has the biggest and the best in the world collection of portraits of governors of the Bank of England. There is no, <laughs> there is no other institution which can match the size and quality of the collection of these portraits. Um, yes, they did commission a portrait of me, and the, the young portrait painter, Diana Blakeney, painted my portrait. I'm very pleased with it. Uh, it was exhibited outside the bank. But the most famous portrait is undoubtedly the portrait of Montague Norman by Augustus John. Uh, which shows him as a rather magical figure, very much as everyone else saw him. But uh, Montague Norman himself hated it because he didn't want people to think of him like that. Uh, he wasn't that self-aware. And so he banned it from being shown in the bank while he was still governor. And when it was being painted, he would go occasionally to, he had to go regularly to Augustus John's studio. And the, the car would drive around uh, Augustus John's studio in Chelsea two or three times to make sure the coast was clear and then stopped while Montague Norman jumped out straight through the front door and then after having been painted for a bit, when he came out again he'd look around carefully to see that there were no journalists you know, finding out what he was doing there and then he'd walk around the corner to a back street where the car was parked to get in it so he was absolutely determined that no one would find out that this portrait was being yeah. built I mean constructed uh, but it's a wonderful portrait, and it has been lent to uh, many exhibitions. That's probably the greatest portrait that we have. But as I say, it is the biggest collection of portraits. If, if it's not uh, trespassing, um, as, as, as a man of the world of um, finance who has to um, have his portrait painted for the Bank of England collection, what were your thoughts when your portrait was being commissioned? You had some say, I imagine. In, uh, in who was chosen to certainly, take it and certainly. how you were represented so as well. And then I had a long conversation with Diana about the imagery that the painting... And I, basically, I talked to her about my philosophy as governor, what I tried to do, the importance of transparency, my role as someone who was trying to educate people about what was going on in the economy, so that the, the teaching role, if you like. And those things come out in, in the portrait. I think now is the time where we should throw this open to questions. Yes, there we are. Go ahead, sir. We've talked about this puerile item called money, or whatever it was called, by Kenneth Clark. There was some talk not so long ago about the artists getting a commission, a, a, an annual commission, or part of a sale, that when a sale took place, um, a bit like a footballer sells for 50 million, he may get 10%. Has that advanced? Has the, uh, the impoverished artist still lost track of his, his own work? Uh, Droit de Suite, that's, that's called. Um, I think it's um, in operation in certain parts of Europe. I'm not sure it's in operation here. There may be somebody in the audience who knows the answer to that. But Droit de Suite, um, it is in operation in Britain too. Well, if the analogy with footballers is anything to go by, we certainly do not want to encourage that uh, 
too much. I, the question is, what, why it, it, the purpose of this? Uh, would it be right if someone produced a work of art, uh, it was respected, liked, admired, and then 300 years later, it turned out to be worth an absolute fortune? You know, who should benefit from that? Uh, it's not obvious to me that you need to give the benefits of that to the successors of the artist 12 generations on in order to persuade the artist to paint the painting. So I don't think there's any, any incentive argument that you'd want to do for that. And in many ways, it's quite a good argument for saying this ought to accrue to society as a whole. And we have limits on copyright of, of authors so that authors can't equally benefit from or hand to their descendants the benefits of their writing indefinitely. Um, so if someone could prove that they were Shakespeare's descendants, they, if they could get you know, even 10% of the royalties on sales, they'd be doing very nicely. But we don't, we don't allow that. I agree with the limitation, but we're now getting to a point where artists don't have to wait for young years to be discovered. Mm. They're having some wonderful legends uh, in their own life. Sure enough. And as a result, you get agents like football agents who are in taking a share of the proceeds that people get by selling their works of art. Question? Um, when a work of art is in high demand and is at risk of being sold, usually overseas, to a private purchaser, um, and, and the National Gallery wishes to acquire this painting, how is it determined uh, whether the painting is one of national importance? Uh, so as to uh, qualify for, um, uh, for, for acquisition by the gallery? Well, we have a, a system uh, in this country that's been in operation since the 1950s, whereby we need to uh, determine whether a work of art, when it's at the moment of being um, potentially exported, uh, conforms to uh, one or more of three criteria, which are called the Waverley Criteria, um, which uh, focus on the um, historic importance of a work of art, on its uh, aesthetic merits, and thirdly, on uh, its uh, significance for a particular branch or field of study. So on that basis, um, the decision is taken by the relevant expert. If, it was, if it's an, an old master painting, it would be the National Gallery. If it's a, if it's a, 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 you know, if it's a drawing, it would be the British Museum. So th th there are the... Uh, as it were, the expert, the recognised expert advisers, and uh, the arguments are put before the Export Reviewing Committee, and the Export Reviewing Committee will make a recommendation to the uh, Minister, and the Minister will take a decision <coughs> on whether that work is temporarily stopped, that's all. Um, our rules in this country are different from other European countries which are much more protective towards their patrimony. So, for example, in Italy, Greece, and Spain, the southern countries, uh, you can actually place an export ban on a work without the state acquiring it. Um, the, the more you move uh, north in Europe, the more liberal the uh, regulations become. Generally speaking, I think um, people perceive the uh, British export system as being pretty fair, uh, although I think in recent times um, there's been cause for some concern about how um, it, it's actually um, operating. But it's on that basis that the significance of a work of art is established. After that, it's a question of which museum or which institution would like to try and acquire and whether it can find the funds to do that. And there is the scheme under which some or all of the tax paid by the UK seller uh, can be used to subsidise the purchase by a British gallery? Yes, we have what's called a private treaty sale in, uh, in this country where a work of art which has been, it's a little bit technical, but conditionally exempted, that means uh, when uh, the former owner has died and the work has passed uh, in inheritance to the next generation, instead of paying the tax at that point, you can, um, as it were, put it off. Uh, you can be temporarily exempted from paying it. And when the time comes then to sell that work of art, um, the, the, uh, uh, the state can um, make the tax, as it were, available for the institution that wants to acquire it. So that means that um, Schedule Three bodies or national institutions and other recognised museums and so on 
can uh, acquire a work of art, generally speaking, at around 70%, around 70% of its, uh, of its recognised market value. That gives us a tremendous advantage, but when a, you know, when a picture is worth 50 million, well, 70% is still a huge amount of money to try and, uh, to try and raise. I mean, it's quite a tricky issue to know what the right regime is, because if we started to have a debate in this country about whether exports of art in a certain category deemed by the experts to meet certain criteria should literally be banned, then that would clearly affect the value to current owners, and it would be effectively lowering their wealth. Um, that might encourage some people to get paintings out while the going was good, but it's, it would certainly be effectively a redistribution of wealth from those who own the paintings to others. Um, it might make, you know, that, that, that's an issue. Do we, what, what attitude do we have to the people who uh, either have bought or have acquired through inheritance great paintings which they have? You know, what, to what extent do we want to put limitations on their ability to sell it? Um, and I think so far the UK scheme has been a balance between a complete free market and a complete prohibition on export of paintings. But it, I'm sure there's plenty to be discussed and it may well be the case that it's not working as well as it could. There's a question from this side. There's one at the front here in a minute, but any other at the back? Come to the lady at the front. Do we have a microphone here? Uh, that lady's got the microphone over there. Oh, OK. We'll come to you in a second, if I may. <laughs> So the next one will be on the front row. Sorry. Um, in recent years, there's been quite a bit of research into art as an asset class. And while on average they say that perhaps it isn't, um, if you have significant experience or expertise, there is money to be made in, in, in the area. And I would imagine given most museums' uh, level of expertise and also their prestige, the provenance, it seems to me that that would be a very interesting way for them to earn additional revenue. And I'm curious as to your thoughts on that. In, in a way, it's an issue that doesn't arise for us because we can't sell them. So, um, you know, when we acquire a, a work of art, it suddenly becomes valueless. Um, so we may have, you know, paid a huge amount of money to acquire it, but once we bought it, it no longer has any value um, at all, technically. Um, so, so what happens in the market affects us when we're trying to acquire. What happens after we've acquired the work is, um, is, is much um, lesser importance to us, except um, when we lend works of art, because we have to lend uh, and we have to request uh, insurance coverage. So we have to request insurance coverage at the current market value. Uh, of the work. So a work that may have been acquired at a relatively small sum because the artist wasn't considered particularly uh, important in 1910, uh, all of a sudden it's become much more uh, valuable uh, in market terms and so we have to uh, ask for that insurance valuation um, to be to be recognised. And if the work were to be damaged or lost, God forbid, uh, when it's lent, uh, then that's the, that's the figure that would have to be met um, with, with an insurance claim. This has happened to me um, once, I have to say, um, in uh, the museum I worked in previously, where a work by the great Spanish still life painter Melendez uh, was lent to an exhibition venue that um, caught fire. Uh, the, um, the, the, the picture was fortunately saved um, from, the, uh, from the walls by the, by the local fire service, who happened to be next door to where the gallery uh, showing this work um, was. Um, the picture was brought back to the gallery. The frame was very badly damaged. The picture was brought back to the gallery. Um, it was very smelly. Um, it smelled of smoke. Um, it, funnily enough, it showed um, smoked herring. So people looked at the picture <laughs> and they thought, my goodness, this is very realistic. Um, but anyway, the, 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 the loss or the, the loss in value of the picture because you know, it, it had been um, slightly damaged by smoke that you'd be much less inclined to lend it in the future and so on was recognized in the insurance claim and the insurance claim was um, was was was, uh, was honored there was a wonderful moment a few years ago when the national audit office had the bright idea of trying to get every museum and gallery to produce a balance sheet with the value of all their paintings on the balance sheet and as Gabrielli said it, it, you know, why would, did you want to do this? Well, you might want to value some paintings if you were loaning them out, but f f the balance sheet will be valueless to, to, uh, in terms of informational value because it might record some accumulated 
past cost. But the fact is that since we can't sell them, it's very hard to know what, you know, there's no resale value at all. And it was absolutely a pointless exercise, completely pointless exercise to try and guess what the value of a painting that had been in the National Gallery for 120 years and never been transacted in the meantime and was clearly an individual piece of art. So, um, you know, I, I think that, that as an asset class, people do talk a lot about buying paintings you know, because it, art is an asset class. I think they tend to want to restrict that to the sort of paintings that they think that they can sell quickly, that there's a market in. But as we saw, uh, not just in art, but also in other assets, markets that seem liquid one day can seem utterly illiquid the next. And that's been true of contemporary art, and it's certainly true of all master art, where the frequency of transactions is so low as to make estimates of values almost, values almost meaningless, I think. Now, there's a question at the front here. And we should probably make this the last question, I think. A follow-up question on art as an asset class. Looking specifically at contemporary art, with your expertise in terms of the overlap of art and money, what do you see as the future trends for contemporary art as an asset class? And do you see a role in that for museums and galleries and art institutions? Well, speaking, I've always made it very clear I never forecast any future asset price of any <laughs> description. Art, stock, shares, bonds, exchange rates, particularly exchange rates, all kinds of things. I never make forecasts of them. Other people seem to be only too willing to do that, uh, and they don't seem to mind when their forecasts turn out to be wrong half the time and right half the time. So uh, I, I don't know. I think what's, what will be more interesting is to ask Gabrielli perhaps to talk about whether this... Um, enthusiasm for building collections of contemporary art that seems to have gripped many of the people who've made a lot of money and want to build a collection is going to survive, or whether there is any prospect of persuading people to take seriously the, the building up of a collection of, of old master paintings. Um, I think I'm going to avoid answering your question, partly because um, professionally it doesn't concern me. Um, and secondly, I'm not a collection uh, a collector myself, so it, it, uh, it's, it's, it's a question I don't feel um, I, I have a kind of professional or, or even a very strong personal response to. Um, I think it's, it's necessary for museums to have a close relationship with collectors. That's um, absolutely mm -hmm. fundamental. So certainly I think a museum of contemporary art um, needs to have a close relationship with um, collectors of contemporary art because... Um, the, it can be mutually uh, beneficial, and as we were saying before, you know, the, the works in private collections have a habit um, of ending up in in, uh, in public collections, whether by gift or uh, or acquisition. So I think that relationship is tremendously um, important. Um, and in terms of um, what the what, what an institution that collects um, older uh, works of art, um, I, I also think it's ter terribly uh, important. There may be fewer. Uh, collector, so one has to nourish them more, uh, more lovingly, uh, more uh, carefully, and find opportunities to share um, knowledge, expertise, uh, enthusiasm. And I think we're tremendously fortunate in in this great city, uh, where there is so much to be seen, so much expertise close at hand, where there are um, still very, very important um, private collections, and where new collections are being formed, including of old art, but also of Asian art or mm. um, contemporary art, of course. Gabrielli, say something about the, the link between the National Gallery and contemporary artists. Yes, that's a very interesting uh, topic. Um, very, very briefly, um, what we perceive often as historic collections, almost um, all from the start were contemporary collections. So we mentioned Goya before. Well, Goya was exhibited in the Prado when he was still alive. And the National Gallery, too, had works of art in the past uh, by artists who were still alive. I mean, Turner was sort of on the cusp. He left works uh, to the National Gallery's uh, collection, most of which are now um, at, the, uh, at the Tate. But there have been moments where um, works of art by contemporary living artists were acquired by the National Gallery. So that separation that we tend to see nowadays is, is perhaps more false than, than we really uh, do think it is. The other thing I always think is terribly important is that although these are historic collections, they're viewed by contemporary audiences. It's you and I 
who are living in the year 2017 um, and going to see these collections. So we're seeing them with uh, contemporary eyes. Often when you talk to many contemporary artists, it's often the historic collections which are the principal source of their uh, inspiration. So I think that um, separation is a largely um, artificial one, and I tend to see things in terms of this sort of great flow of art from antiquity right up to our times with different emphases, um, different uh, motivations and so on, but fundamentally that's uh, a, a creative uh, urge, that desire to produce something that creates a, a, a response in the community, um, whether that's a religious community, whether it's a community of um, art specialists or collectors, is, is pretty much constant through history. I think that's a wonderful note on which to end. And Ladies and gentlemen, let me thank you for coming, but let me also remind you that the next figure on the Bank of England £20 note will actually be Turner. Thank you.